as opposed, as opposed to people who are supporting him now because of the market. So he showed at the Taj Gallery in the 50s. Um, you know, the physicist Homi Bhabha collected his work in the 50s for the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Lalit Kala Academy, the National Gallery of Modern Art, um, uh, Jahangir Nicholson. Um, you know, so these, these, these institutional collections were incredibly important for us to source things from and to convince them to share their works and allow them to be on view for a year and a half. Um, another difficulty was the fact that we didn't have any kind of archival or first-hand uh, bibliographic research. Um, everything that we've put together has been done um, from scratch. So if you go to the Guggenheim's website now, his uh, Gaitonde's chronology and exhibition history are available for download for any students or researchers who want access to his life. Uh, if you can't afford the catalog, at least you have um, very, very authentic information about his international exhibitions that start in the 50s with the Venice Biennial. Um, so it was very important for us to share and disseminate that scholarship, um, which um, wasn't made available to us when we started uh, doing this research. Um, there's been a lot of kind of discussion about the market and how the Guggenheim's exhibition is, uh, has come about because of the fact that he has done so well in the market, and I'd like to say it's the other way around. And the Christie sale that happened in Bombay in 2013 happened as a result of the retrospective. Um, you know, we don't do retrospectives and scholarships because of the market supporting us. The market comes and supports us after the fact. So I'd like to just make that really, really clear. Um, and then I think in, in, from a larger perspective, um, you know, Gaitonde being a completely unknown figure, both in New York and in Venice, there was a lot of resistance from the international press. You know, why is the Guggenheim doing this? Who is this guy? What do we know about him? How do we place him? How do we study him? But I think in the last six, seven years, um, there's been a huge kind of um, shift in the mentality of the Western <coughs> press. And I've seen this being an Asian art curator. This extends to Japanese art, Korean art, Chinese art, non-Western art in general. You know, you could be looking at even Central European art, and they think of it as non-Western. Um, that it's really now the responsibility of museums to re-educate themselves and re-educate their audiences by showcasing non-Western modernism on the same platform as Western modernism. So this has been a huge change in the attitude, perspective, openness, ability, um, you know, intellectual kind of horizon of the, of the press in the West. Um, and then I think I'd like to just thank, we had a very small team putting this together. Um, my assistant curator in New York was Amara Antilla, who's currently doing a project in Dhaka, which I'm really happy about, I think on Monica Korea. And uh, Sarvesh Hari Valabdas, who's here, I can see him. Um, you know, it's a myth that uh, international museums have great resources. It's a complete myth. There's no funding, very severe budget restrictions, no human resources. Um, one does this uh, in, in many ways, of course, with the blessing of the museum, but also despite the museum. And it takes a huge army of people. I mean, the lenders, their faith in the project, the funders, so many colleagues in the art world asking them advice, you know, getting feedback, patching this story together. It was a very, very complex and also very fragile and very tenuous jigsaw puzzle. So I'm just glad that it's, it's you know, uh, done and, the, and the, the artworks are now back safely with their lenders. And um, my mother asked me to do this three years ago, so I'm really glad that I can just share some of what we've gone through uh, in putting this together. Sudhir was, I was talking to Sudhir Patwarthan earlier and I said if we could do this for all of our artists, slowly, step by step, we'd be doing um, a huge service to trying to archive these really important stories. Um, very few of Gaitonde's contemporaries still survive. I mean, Ram, Ram Kumar was one of our lenders. It was a huge honor for me that he 
gave me one of Gaitonde's works on paper. Krishan Khanna was so generous, Akbar Padamsi. Um, and then the next generation of artists who were inspired by him and taught at the JJ. Um, without these oral histories, we wouldn't have been able to put this together. So it's, there's a great sense of urgency in doing this scholarship and writing these histories, not just for India and for our own scholarship and our own sense of the artistic and intellectual terrain of the 20th century, but also in turn it affects world art history, you know, and how scholars trained in European or, modern, or American art are now looking at the non-West to revisit their own understandings of you know, cultural production in the 20th century. So, thanks. Thanks for a very fascinating insight into the works of Guy Tunde. Uh, I'm a little bit of a layman in paintings, but I want to appreciate you have inspired me. Uh, I would like to know whether there is a correlation between surrealism and uh, expressionism. Well, uh, there is, um, but I think that, um, you know, it's not really pertinent to, to Guy Tunde's story. The, the big debate that was happening in India in the 1950s, not just here but also in Paris, was this kind of dialectic between figuration and abstraction. And like I said, most the current at the time in India was tending towards figuration, narrativity, expressionism. Expressionism, of course, is informed by surrealism, but that's an art historical genealogy. Um, and critics like Gita Kapoor, uh, you know, that's why I brought up Richard Bartholomew, because he was one of the few who actually supported people like Gaitonde, Dhyaneshwar Natkarni. There were very few writers who were dedicated to looking at this group of abstractionists. But most of the critics were tending towards artists who were working with, you know, post-colonialism and narrativity and storytelling and expressionism, because that's what they considered serious and important in an in a independence context. So it's, there is a relationship between surrealism and expressionism, but it's not really pertinent to Gaitonde's struggle. The struggle here was really the fact that he was less recognized because he tended towards the non-objective and the abstract at a time when the trend in the mainstream was really towards expressionism and narrativity. Yeah. And figuration. And that's, how, that's what most of the critics um, focused on. Well, this was, I think, a person, um, I think, you know, he was an artist who was extremely self-confident, and he charted his own path, and he had very few peers around him who supported him. Um, you know, so he was real avant-garde, right? I, I think he was, not just because of the fact that he um, traced his own path, but because the, the work is not unlike any other, any other work. The fact that he came up with this I mean, when you stand in front of this painting, you're confounded about how it was made. It's absolutely impossible to figure out how it was made. So you lose yourself. Abs yeah. It's an extremely complex, layered, contemplative, but also free and, and spontaneous way of painting. It's extremely difficult to describe it. Is there a course we can do to study well, my mother runs a, a course, and you should check with Rohit at the end of the lecture. Absolutely. Thank you. There's a question here. Sorry. Yes. Hi, good evening. Hi. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I had a question. Can you precise a little bit more the relation between um, Gaitonde and Mark Rothko? Um, because it's quite difficult to know when he was in New York if yeah, sure. they meet. and. And again, thank you so much for bringing uh, such a wonderful show together in New York. I'm from Paris. I really wish the show could travel in Paris one day. I know. Uh, I'm sorry that and it couldn't. I think there is still lots of effort to do to make those artists recognized Absolutely. Uh, in some part of Europe. Thank you. No, and, and of course, my great disappointment, and I should have mentioned this as well, is that it's not coming to India. Uh, and we tried our best. Um, 
we spoke to various institutions, of course, that exist in Bombay and in Delhi. But unfortunately, between the difficulty of international loans and insur high insurance numbers, the security of the artwork, and the fact that we lack infrastructure, uh, you know, great curatorial teams, great conservation teams um, to handle these 45, 50 works of art. Many of the international lenders were really um, shy or let's say scared or petrified of sending things, yeah, I shouldn't be diplomatic, uh, petrified of sending things to India. And um, it was, I mean, it's deeply saddening because um, you know, you're able to access at least some of the work through this uh, presentation, but all the students, all the artists, all the scholars, all the thinkers across India, we barely ever get to see these works. Um, you know, you need permission to go into the TIFR campus, you just can't walk in. Some of the work is hanging at the NGMA in the permanent collection, so I really urge you to go to Delhi and see them in person. The Taj works, there are I think three or four uh, at any given time in there, um, here in Apollo Bandar. Um, you, have you need permission to go into the Nicholson galleries. I mean, these are, these are works of art that are very, very difficult to encounter in person. Um, so it's a great shame that it hasn't come to India. But just to address your specific question about Rothko. Um, so in 64, 65, when he was in New York, uh, Krishan Khanna took him to Rothko's studio. Um, and I believe that was the only encounter that he had with Rothko. Uh, Krishan Khanna was a friend of Rothko's, so I think they saw each other more frequently. Um, but Gaitonde only met him once. And um, of course you can draw certain formal parallels um, in terms of um, you know, the layering of the, of the paint. Uh, both, it's, what's interesting is that both Rothko and Gaitonde used masking tape some point to create these borders uh, in their paintings uh, and to create this kind of effacement between the painting and the and the and the atmosphere around the painting you know this kind of borderlessness um, but Rothko's intention with his painting was very different and you know one should be careful about making comparisons that are just purely visual and one should think about the philosophy or the motivation or the intention of the artist and Rothko was very interested in displaying a certain kind of human drama. Uh, you, you read any of his interviews, you know, a certain kind of angst and a certain heroism and a certain tragedy and ecstasy, um, you know, sublimated in painting. And, and Gaiton didn't have, I hope it's clear that he didn't have any of those intentions. But thank you for asking. I tried to address them all before you would ask. You preempted the question and answer session. Okay, well, we have a small gift oh, for such a you. wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks.